All right, it's good to be here today. I know we got a lot of people out, but uh, we are thankful uh, to be here together. Uh, you know, even when we're not very big in number, and we never are right now, but, um, you know, the Lord still blesses, and uh, I'm encouraged when I leave, having been able to hear uh, the lesson that Brother Philip brings, and uh, being able to worship the Lord together, and to be able to just think through those things. Um, it's an encouragement to me uh, to be here with you guys, and so um, thankful that we're here. We sang several songs. I'm, this is not the lesson today, but um, you know we sing these songs, and there's not very many of us. And uh, poor brother Philip, if I'm if I'm his backup voice, that's a problem. Uh, but um, uh, we 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 enjoy being able to come together and to sing before the Lord and um, make a joyful noise, as the Bible describes it, right? And for me, it's probably more noise, but. Uh, still thankful uh, that we have that ability and that uh, the way the Lord has given us to be able to praise His name. You know, there's just a couple things that jumped out. S -s Hymn number 61 was, Savior like a shepherd lead us. That third verse says, Thou hast promised to receive us, poor and sinful though we be. I just think that that is a good reminder of our condition when the Lord called us and the Lord redeemed us, right? And He's promised that He will uh, bring us to Him or He will come back for us. And uh, just amazing to think about the mercy that He showed despite the fact that we're poor and we're sinful. Uh, we sang the song, O Worship the King. Uh, I like how many things that that calls Him. Uh, in the first verse, it talks about He is our shield and our defender. He's the Ancient of Days. And in the last verse, it calls Him our Maker, our Defender, our Redeemer, and our Friend. Uh, and uh, we are here to worship Him and to declare our praise to Him. And those are some really great titles as we think about, uh, I say titles, maybe descriptors, of Him and who He is and what He has done for us. Uh, and so we are so thankful to know that He's our Maker, our Defender, our Redeemer, and our Friend. All right, but before I get too carried away with that, let's get to our lesson today. We're going to be back in the book of 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Um, We've been, of course, talking about how the New Testament quotes the Old Testament and the, the ways that it is a fulfillment of all of those things and, and how uh, the Old Testament scriptures were so ingrained uh, in, in, the, in the thoughts of, of those that were inspired by the, the Lord to write down these scriptures. Um, We've been going through the book of 2 Corinthians, and it's interesting. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here, but um, the Bible, Brother Philip's talking about Bible interpretation, right? And you don't want to just jump in and grab one verse uh, without understanding the context of what's around it. Um, but you not only understand the context of that verse in the chapter, but the context of that chapter in the book of 2 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians is interesting because it's really a continuation of 1 Corinthians. And so uh, understanding the full complexity of, of 2 Corinthians, you need to understand 1 Corinthians. And, and that's the way the Bible is, right? Uh, it is so intertwined with uh, the Bible as a whole, and, and we're so thankful to, to know that. But listen, it means, it means study. It means a lot of study. <laughs> it means get in it. Uh, and, and the tips that Brother Philip has been giving us on Sunday mornings and Sunday school class are great reminders of how we need to be doing that. Now, in the book of 2 Corinthians, he's been going over a lot of things, part of which is um, defending himself against some accusations that have been said. Uh, he is outlining for them why he didn't come. 
Uh, he's also encouraging them in some things that he had talked to them about in 1 Corinthians and that they seem to have, have taken on. But if you remember, uh, he starts to talk about the ministry that they've been given. That was way back in like chapter 3 where he described that they had been given this ministry of the New Testament and that they were to carry that out. And he's really been laying out uh, for a, several chapters now the things that we need to be willing to go through in order to carry out that ministry of the New Testament. And by the time he gets to chapter 6, you would think that he'd maybe moved beyond that, uh, but you find that he is still outlining that. He says in verse 1, We then as workers together with him beseech you also that you receive not the grace of God in vain. Now, he's continuing a thought here, right? Because he says, We then as workers together with him beseech you also. That, that phraseology indicates that this is a continuation of a previous thought. So if you back up to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, let's just read the last few verses and, and kind of get the reference again of what we're talking about. Uh, we could start in verse 20. He says, Now then we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead be reconciled, to God. So he declares that they are representatives of Christ through and, and, and basically that through them, God is calling you near. God is inviting you. That's what that word beseech means, to draw near, to invite near. Right? So he says, hey, as representatives of Christ, God through us is inviting you. <laughs> And our desire is that you would be reconciled to God. Now, if you're lost, reconciled to God, you need to be redeemed. You need to be uh, pardoned of your sin. If you're saved, did you know there is still uh, a reconciling? I, we talked about David the other day and his sin with Bathsheba. And, and, we, and we hear in his Psalm 51 that broken heart over sin and his coming to God, seeking to be forgiven and to be uh, renewed in his spirit. That is a reconciling uh, to God. Now, obviously, there's a difference, right? If you're bought and paid for and you're redeemed, that's eternal. You are eternally secure. You're not going to lose that salvation. That doesn't mean that you don't stumble and fall and that in your desire to be pleasing to God that you don't need to go to him and ask forgiveness and to be reconciled. Now, I think actually the, the, the main theme of this here, though, is dealing with that gospel message of reconciliation with God. And so he says, hey, we're ambassadors for Christ. He, he is using us to invite you near. In verse 21, for he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made right, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. Hey, our message of reconciliation through Jesus Christ. God took His Son, who was perfect, and He made Him sin for us. In other words, Jesus Christ took on Himself our sin, that we may be made righteous. In God, And it's with those thoughts in mind that he opens up chapter 6 saying, We then beseech you also. Right? Now in the middle of that, we then beseech you also, he says, as workers together with him. We then, as workers together with him, beseech you also that you receive not the grace of God in vain. Now, if you're talking to the church at Corinth, what does he mean by that you might not receive the grace of God in vain? Um, if you're talking to a group of saved people, well, they're already saved, so I don't think there's vanity in that. There's no vainness in that. 
But I believe part of what he's describing here is he is calling them to be co-laborers <laughs> of that gospel message. Don't, don't, don't have received the message, accepted the Lord as your Savior, and then just go on doing what you're doing. Man, you have received this gospel message. Don't receive that and be redeemed, and then just do nothing with it. That would be taking that gospel message of God in vain. He's calling them to be co-laborers with him in that message. He actually says in verse 2, For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in a day of salvation have I succored thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Now that is in parentheses, so he's, he's adding that subnote within his message here, but this actually right away in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 is where we see a reference to the Old Testament. When he says, For he hath said, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in a day of salvation have I succored thee. That is a quote from Isaiah. So if you take your Bibles and let's turn over to the book of Isaiah, uh, chapter, let me see if I can pull it up here. I think it's chapter 49. He's actually quoting verse 8, or part of verse 8, which says, Thus saith the Lord, in an acceptable time have I heard thee, and in a day of salvation have I helped thee. Um, now the last half of verse 2 in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 is actually uh, the apostle. He is not continuing to quote. He just quotes uh, the first half of that verse is a quote, and he's quoting Isaiah chapter 9, 49 verse 8. Now, for, chapter 49 is actually dealing with, uh, in a lot of ways, uh, the, the restoration of Israel. But I want you to understand a little bit more about what Paul is referring back to. So we're going to read Isaiah chapter 49, okay? And there's a lot of reading, so bear with us. Isaiah chapter 49, verse 8. Listen, O isle, unto me, and hearken, ye people, from far. The Lord hath called me from the womb, from the bowels of my mother, hath he made mention of my name. And he hath made my mouth like a sharp sword, in the shadow of his hand hath he hid me, and made me a polished shaft, in his quiver hath he hid me. And he said unto me, Thou art my servant, O Israel, in whom I will be glorified. Then I said, I have labored in vain, I have spent my strength for naught, and in vain, yet surely my judgment is with the Lord, and my work with my God. And now saith the Lord that formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob again to him. Though Israel be not gathered, yet shall I be glorious in the eyes of the Lord, and my God shall be my strength. And he said, It is a light thing, it is a light thing that thou shouldest be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved of Israel. I will also give thee for a light to the Gentiles, that thou mayest be my salvation unto the end of the earth. Now that light to the Gentiles is the Messiah. And then he is going to use a lot of stuff there. But listen to verse 7. Thus saith the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel and his Holy One, to him whom man despiseth, to him whom the nation abhorreth, to a servant of rulers, kings shall see and arise, princes also shall worship because of the Lord that is faithful and the Holy One of Israel, and he shall choose thee. Thus saith the Lord, in an acceptable time have I heard thee, and in a day of salvation have I helped thee. That's the context of what Paul quotes from. He's talking about this time uh, when one will come and the Holy One, the Redeemer of Israel, will come and be the fulfillment of all of these things that have been talked about. Now there's more going on in, in, in Isaiah 49 and there's, I think, some reference to some things maybe yet to come. But understand the context in which Paul is using this is to talk about the fact that the Messiah has come and today is the day of salvation, right? And so in, our, in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, when he talks about being workers together and to beseech or to invite near, 
that you might receive uh, not the grace of God in vain, he then goes over and he says, hey, listen, you've received this gospel message. You've been redeemed. Be co-laborers with us. Don't do this stuff in vain. The, the work that you do for God is not going to be in vain because, listen, the Messiah has come. And today we have that gospel message to carry out. Today is the day of salvation. The accepted time of the Lord has come and He is here to be a help to us. And He, he, he then, in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, the last half of verse 2, the apostle then comes along and says, Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. He says, listen, you think about those things that were said back in Isaiah chapter 49. Listen, they have come. They are here. Now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. And then in verse 3, he picks up and starts to continue on with his, uh, his message here. Verse 3 says, giving no offense in anything that the ministry be not blamed. Paul wants to carry this gospel message out in a way that the focus is on the message and not on the missteps and the miscues and the mistakes of the messenger. Giving no offense in anything that a ministry be not blamed, but in all things, approving ourselves as the ministers of God. Now, that word approving there uh, some might would think that, well, he's trying to boast himself up. He's trying to lift himself up as being a, a, approved by God. Listen, I don't think that's what he's saying. He's, he's really here saying uh, that he wants to be um, united in this message uh, as the minister of God. He, he wants to be pleasing. Let's, let's look at it that way. He wants to be pleasing to God as he carries out this message in all things proving ourselves as the ministers of God okay and then he starts to outline what that means in much patience in afflictions in necessities in distresses I want to pause here As you serve the Lord, listen, the Lord will bless. The Lord will be with you. But do not take from those statements the idea that life is going to be easy as you do that. Okay? And I think I said it last week. Matter of fact, the more you draw close to the Lord and the more you serve Him, Sometimes the more trials and troubles may come your way. But God is sufficient. God will help you. God will give you the strength to do that. And as he's calling them near, don't forget that. He's calling them near and he's saying, hey, listen, don't have received this grace and this message of God in vain. Be co-laborers. Be workers in this. Oh, and by the way, today's the day. It's the accepted time. Those things in Isaiah 49 have started to come true. And listen, we need to carry out this ministry. And it's going to take patience. And it's going to come with some afflictions. But don't stop serving Him. Don't stop carrying that message. It's going to have some necessities. Um, th that, that word there, as you think about it, uh, re remember what Brother Philip said about you know, having, a, um, having a good concordance, a good dictionary. Uh, the idea here in this, when you look this up in Strong's, is, um, hey, listen, there's going to be some time of need you might go through some distressing times and you have some need. Uh, need usually means a lacking of some things, right? And then in the very next phrase he says, in distresses. 
In verse 5, it escalates a little bit, and it says, in stripes, in imprisonments, in tomb waltz, in labors, in watchings, in fastings. And as we think about those, most of those we're pretty familiar with, right? Uh, we get patience, we get afflictions, we get needs, we get distress. In stripes, he's talking about the times where he was beaten, imprisonments, and times that he was thrown in jail. In tomb waltz, that's, uh, that's kind of a, uh, an idea of uh, unsettled times. In labors, you know there's work, right? We understand the word work, we understand the word labor, but um, the word sometimes is underestimated. Labor is not a light thing. Um, and this is like a heavy burden. <laughs> this, is, this is something that, you know, there's times when I work, and it's light work, and I don't really feel wore out when I'm done. The word labor, though, brings with it the idea of you're probably going to be tired when you're done. Uh, that's kind of the word labor. In watchings and in fastings. Um, it's neat when you look up this word watchings because when you look up the words in strongs, it actually says sleeplessness. Sleeplessness. There may be times when, listen, because of the work you're doing for the Lord, you're going to lose some sleep. Whether that's because you're in deep prayer and fasting and showing concern over things, or maybe you're having to travel long nights to get where you need to be the next... The idea here is that, listen, in the work of the Lord, there's going to be times of sleeplessness. And in fastings, I think we probably understand that word there. Uh, there's going to be some times where, listen, you may need to go without uh, food and water because you're meditating and you're, you're, you're fasting over some things that are going on. In verse 6, he says, by pureness. He changes gears here a little bit, if you notice, um, because he talks about in afflictions and necessities and distresses and stripes and imprisonment and tumult and labors and watchings and in fastings, right? Those are all what we would kind of define as um, negative things. Those are trials. But in verse 6, he says, by pureness, by knowledge, by long suffering. That word long suffering is kind of that idea of. Um, Listen, when Brother Philip works with me and I'm being obstinate, he's long-suffering. He's working with me over a period of time. He's being patient with me by kindness, by the Holy Ghost, by love unfeigned. You, you see the difference in this verse here between the other ones, right? Man, all those trials, all those troubles... Keep at it. Keep carrying that message. Keep living in a way that doesn't cause a negative thing to be shown on the message that you're carrying. But hey, listen, you're also going to have to, you're going to have to focus on purity in your life. You're going to have to be knowledgeable. You need to be digging in. You need to be studying. You need to look into this word by long suffering, by patience, by dedication to this by kindness hey by the leading of the Holy Ghost and by love unfeigned that word there unfeigned again is not one that we use much and again I it's so neat brother Philip talked about the different tips that you can use when you study the Bible and I've already mentioned it like three times today Strong's Concordance and a dictionary would be good ways to follow up on this word, right? The word unfeigned is the idea of sincere. It's sincere. So what does he mean? By sincere 
love. Sincereness. Have you ever seen people? Have you ever seen people that show acts of love, but you kind of get the idea it's not very sincere? They have ulterior motives. They have another reason they're doing it. Is it a loving action? Yes, but they're not sincere in it. He says, listen, as you carry out this gospel message and as you go through these things, man, you need to be, you got, you got to be faithful, you got to be pure, you got to be knowledgeable, you got to be digging into this, you got to be patient. And you got to show love, and it needs to be sincere. He's listing out a lot of stuff here. Verse 7 by the word of truth by the word of truth he's changing gears a little bit again list some of the trials list some of the positive things you need to be focused on and then to some degree starting to list some of the ways that you're going to be able to do those things by the word of truth man you stay with God's word have that be your focus. Have that be what carries you forward. By the power of God, understand you can't actually do this on your own strength. You can't do this on your own strength. And this comes through the power of God. By the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left. You understand here this idea of... Um, Man, you've got an armor that is surrounding you on all sides. And then verse 8, he starts to get into some interesting discussion too. Because he starts to show some contrast. And you have to understand here what he's doing. He says, by honor and dishonor. Wait a second. By honor and dishonor. By an evil report and by a good report, as deceivers and yet true, is Paul saying that sometimes we need to be dishonoring, and sometimes we need to have an evil report, and sometimes we need to be deceivers? He's not saying that. But if you understand the rest of what Paul's been saying in 2 Corinthians, part of the reason why he's writing it, and you study the rest of what Paul did in his ministry, listen, there were times where Paul was treated in a position of honor, and there were times where he was treated in a position of dishonor. He's saying, keep going. Whether people, are, whether people are showing you honor or showing you dishonor, keep going. Whether people tell an evil report of you or a good report of you, keep going. And whether they're calling you deceivers and yet you're telling the truth, keep going. That's what he means by honor, by honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report, as deceivers and yet true. In verse 9, as unknown and yet well known, as dying and behold we live, as chastened and not killed. Listen. Listen. Paul may have been well-known in some circles and unknown in other circles. Keep carrying that gospel message. Keep being faithful to the ministry. Keep on. I think he also means here that it really didn't matter how unknown he was. Listen, he was known to the one that was important. He was known by God. As dying... And yet we live, and behold, we live. He'd put his life on the line many times, and yet here he was. As chastened many times, and yet not killed. In verse 10, these are some interesting verses again as he starts to give some comparisons as sorrowful yet always rejoicing he said how can that be how can you be as sorrowful and yet always rejoicing 
Listen, he saw some things. He went through some things. But his inward man was always rejoicing in the deliverance of God, the redemption of God, and the future promises of God. As poor, yet making many rich. As poor, yet making many rich. Notice he didn't even say here, making myself rich. As poor, yet making many rich. And he didn't mean rich in the worldly sense of the things he was doing was bringing wealth and success to people. He recognized that the work the Lord had him doing, hey listen, it may put him in a position where he didn't have much. But he recognized that through the work that the Lord had him doing, many were made rich spiritually. As having nothing, and yet possessing all things. What was it that he said here just a little bit ago in a prior chapter as he was describing how and why he was able to do the work that he does? He said, hey, listen, I don't look on the things I can see. I'm looking on the unseen things. I'm looking on the things yet to come. I'm not looking on the temporal, the temporary, the things that come for a season. I'm looking on the things of eternity. I think he's able to say this right here because of that very attitude. As having nothing, and yet possessing all things. Hey, listen, the things that are important, I have. I have the redemption of God. I have the promises of God. I'm a child of His. I may look like I got nothing, and I really maybe in this world don't have much. But I am rich. In verse 11, O ye Corinthians, our mouth is open unto you, our heart is enlarged. Don't forget that Paul has had some people making some accusations about him. And hey, Paul said he was going to come back, he was going to come visit us, but he didn't. He says, listen, all this stuff I'm describing, all these things that we wanted to go through, we did this for your sake, we did this to be a benefit to you. And listen, our heart is enlarged to you. We love you. The things I've written to you, I wrote to you because I love you. He said that in some other places. He says, oh, Corinthians, our mouth is open unto you. Our heart is enlarged. And verse 12, you're not straightened. That, that word straightened there means to be narrowed. You're not narrowed. You're not straightened in us. But you're straightened in your own bowels. He says, this is not us. This is you. And verse 13, he makes a call to them. He says, now for a recompense in the same. That word recompense brings with it the idea of reward. Now for a reward in the same, I speak as unto my children, be also enlarged. Don't be so narrowed. Don't be in such narrowed bitterness and being led astray. Listen, we love you. Our hearts are enlarged to you. And our desire is that you would have the same toward us. It's kind of what he's saying. Our desire is that you'd have the same toward us, that you would also be enlarged. Now, I, I want to keep going here, um, but I realize that once I start, I, I don't know if I'll be able to finish. Um, it's right after this statement about them being too narrowed or too straightened and that they need to be enlarged in verse 14 where he utters a very famous verse be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness and what communion hath light with darkness now this verse is often used and I think it is a good practical application of it. This verse used is often we jump into this verse by itself and we use it to say, if you're redeemed, if you're bought and paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ, you're a Christian, then don't marry a non-Christian. That's kind of the context in the way that we use that verse. And, and listen, I think that's good advice. I think that's a, a good practical application I don't know that that's specifically what he's talking about here. 
uh, again, we've been talking about carrying out this ministry of the gospel, this new covenant. He's talked about the things you have to go through. And in order to do this, you've got to keep your eye focused on the promises of God. You've got to keep your eye focused on the things that are unseen. You've got to live by faith. And you're going to go through a bunch of stuff. And there's going to be people making false accusations. There's going to be people doing all these things. Keep going. Keep serving God. Don't be so narrow, but be enlarged in your love to each other. And if you're going to do this, if you're going to be able to be these co-laborers with us, you can't be unequally yoked with unbelievers. If you remember in 1 Corinthians, what were some of the things he had talked to them about in 1 Corinthians? We kind of focused a little bit on how that, um, hey, listen, for, <laughs> Corinth was a pagan pagan city with multiple temples to multiple gods and one big thing that was involved with that worship of those idol idols was these big feasts and these big events right and and he got into some of that about how that listen if you're eating meat from that was worshiped to idols but you bought it at the market don't worry about it it's fine but listen be careful going to these things and when people are bragging about this being uh, blessed meat because it was worshipped to an idol, you may need to back off. He's brought with it the idea of, listen, may not be best to go hang out at the temple and be partakers of some of those big feasts. Well, now he's saying, listen, if you're going to be co-laborers with us, you can't be unequally yoked with unbelievers. What fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Uh, that idea there is what concord or what union does Christ have with Satan? There isn't. There isn't a bond between the two of them. Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and my daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Now there's a lot of stuff to try to digest here. I don't think that suddenly between verse 13 and verse 14, he just suddenly dropped what he was talking about and started on a whole new topic. He's beseeching them. He's calling them near. He's calling them to be co-laborers. And he's saying, listen, you can't carry out the things that I just talked about if you're all intertwined with idolatry and unbelievers and listen, I'm not, and I don't think Paul is saying this, we can't separate ourselves from the world so much that we can't carry the message to them, right? Hey, listen, you know what? I work at a company. I spend a lot of time there. I'm around a lot of unbelievers. I work side by side with unbelievers sometimes. That is not being unequally yoked with an unbeliever. Now, I would, I would say I would want to be very cautious about starting to um, live my life following some of the patterns that they follow, spending my time doing more and more of what the world of unbelievers does. Honestly, you probably need to even be careful. Um, I do think, practically speaking, Hey, listen, if you're, if you're looking for a husband, if you're looking for a wife, you really probably need to be looking for a fellow believer. But it's so much deeper than that. You know what it means to be yoked together? The picture that's being drawn there? <laughs> you got two oxen and they've got a yoke which is, which is a, a, a device that um, binds them together 
Because what are they going to be doing? What's, what's the purpose of that yoke? Well, it's not just the work, because that yoke is attached to something they're probably pulling. That yoke is to get them to be pulling in the same direction. So you understand a little bit when you look at that picture what he's saying? Listen, this world of unbelievers, they aren't going to be pulling in the same direction you're pulling. Don't be yoked to an unbeliever. Because listen, light and darkness, in the context of what he's talking about, they're not the same. Christ and Satan, man, they're not, they don't have a pact. They don't have an agreement with each other. And then he reminds them that they are the temple of God. That their bodies are the temple of the living God. If they've been redeemed, if they are one of his children, then their bodies are the temple of the living God. Live your life accordingly. You want, to be a, you want to be a laborer for the Lord? Well, you be yoked to the right thing. <laughs> you be pulling in the same direction as what God wants you to be pulling in. Because your body is a temple of the living God. And it has no business. It has no business being associated with idolatry. Who's he talking to? The people in Corinth in a town filled with pagan idolatry. Temple after temple. <laughs> and he's saying, listen, you guys can't be associated with that stuff. The temple of God has no place around idol worship. He is actually quoting, by the way, some passages here. I want to read a few of them to you. Let's just, because he's, he's doing a few things. Listen, he is quoting some passages, and he is referring to several others. But look, if you would, take your Bibles and turn to Leviticus chapter 26. Leviticus chapter 26. This is he's talking about the blessings of obedience to the children of Israel. And interestingly enough, this starts in verse 1. Ye shall make no idols, nor graven image, nor neither, near, um, neither rear you up a standing image, neither shall ye set up an image of stone in your hand to bow down unto, for I am the Lord your God. Ye shall keep my Sabbaths and, my, and reverence my sanctuary. I am the Lord. If ye walk in my statutes and keep my commandments and do them, then I will give you rain in due season, and the land shall yield your, her increase, and the trees of the field shall yield their fruit, and your washing shall reach unto the vintage, and the vintage shall reach unto the sowing time, and ye shall eat your bread to the full, and dwell in your land safely. And I will give peace in the land, and ye shall lie down, and none shall make you afraid. And I will rid evil beasts out of the land, neither shall the sword go through your land. And ye shall chase your enemies, and they shall fall before you by the sword. And five of you shall chase an hundred, and a hundred of you shall, be, shall put ten thousand to flight. And your enemies shall fall by, before you by the sword, for I will have respect unto you, and make you fruitful, and multiply you, and establish my covenant with you. And ye shall eat old store, and bring forth the old because of the new, and I will set my tabernacle among you, and my soul shall not abhor you. And I will walk among you, and will be your God, and ye shall be my people. I am the Lord your God, which brought you forth out of the land of Egypt, that ye should not be their bondmen. And I have broken the band, bands of your yoke, and made you go upright. Now listen, in this chapter he is talking to the nation of Israel, and he's laying out that he is the only true God, and they're not going to have any other idols. They need to honor him, they need to reverence him, they need to follow his commands and if they do that if they do that he will be with them now did they do that well, they didn't and they ended up going into captivity and there's a lot of stuff going on right 
Let me read to you another place where that same type of verbiage is used. Turn over to the book of Ezekiel, chapter 37. Ezekiel chapter 37. Uh, I might should have quit while I was ahead because I knew that once I got into this, there's going to be a lot to cover. So um, once you get into Ezekiel chapter 37, this is a, uh, if you ever heard about the Valley of the Dry Bones, right? Well, that's the chapter that's being talked about here. And uh, down in, well, let's start down in verse 15. The word of the Lord came again unto me, saying, Moreover, thou son of man, take thee one stick and ride upon it for Judah and for the children of Israel, his companions. Then take another stick and ride upon it for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim, and for all the house of Israel, his companions. And join them one to another into one stick, and they shall become one in thine hand. And when the children of thy people shall speak unto thee, saying, Wilt thou not show us what thou meanest by these? Say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will take the stick of Joseph, which is in the hand of Ephraim, and the tribes of Israel his fellows, and will put them with him, even with the stick of Judah, and make them one stick, and they shall be one in mine hand. And the sticks whereon thou ridest shall be in thine hand before their eyes. And say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will take the children of Israel from among the heathen, whether they be gone, and will gather them on every side, and bring them unto their own land. And I'll make them one nation in the land upon the mountain of Israel, and one king shall be the king to them all, and they shall be no more two nations, neither shall they be divided into two kingdoms any more at all. Neither shall they defile themselves any more with their idols, nor with the detestable things, nor with any of their transgressions. But I will save them out of all their dwelling places, wherein they have sinned, and will cleanse them, so shall they be my people, and I will be their God. And David my servant shall be king over them, and they shall all have one shepherd, and they shall also walk in my judgments and observe my statutes and do them. And they shall dwell in the land that I have given unto Jacob my servant, wherein your fathers have dwelt, and they shall dwell therein, even they and their children, and their children's children forever. And my servant David shall be their prince forever. Moreover, I will make a covenant of peace with them. It shall be an everlasting covenant with them. And I will place them and multiply them and will set my sanctuary in the midst of them forever. My tabernacle also shall be with them. Yea, I will be their God and they shall be my people. That uh, comes back to this idea that you saw in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16, where he says, As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Now, you saw the first reference was to the nation of Israel, uh, and if they would follow God, he would be with them. Now, in Ezekiel, you see a little bit if, different. Um, it, it's similar, and listen, there's a lot going on in Ezekiel that I don't necessarily have time to get into. But understand, when he talks about the king David that shall rule over them forever, by the time Ezekiel came along, listen, David was dead and gone and wasn't going to be ruling over anybody. The idea there, that is actually a picture of the Messiah that would come and rule forever, right? As the rightful heir on the throne of David. And the idea here is that, listen, he is coming and he is going to dwell with you forever and he will be with you and he will be your God, and you are to be his people. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, Paul is reminding them of those things and is telling them, listen, you are God's people. He is with you. He is living in you. And as such, as his, you need to go where he wants you to go, and you need to do what he wants you to do, and you need to not be yoked with unbelievers, and you don't need to be around idolatry, and you don't need to be associating with that stuff. In verse 17, he says, Wherefore come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. 
if you are God's people, if He is dwelling in you, then what you need to do is you need to come out from among this world. You need to come out and be separate from them. I get it. We live our life and we're around people. We can't be witnesses to them if we're not around them. But it doesn't mean that we are like them. It doesn't mean we're living like them. It doesn't mean that we're doing the things that they do. We need to live our life as a people that have God dwelling in us. Far from these things. And we don't have time to do it today. I will tell you that in verse 17, he is also making references to Old Testament, a couple different things. But I believe, and you can look at this when you get home if you want to. Uh, we'll see what we do next week if we, if we pick up here or not. But I will give you the reference to chapter seven, uh, verse 17. It's Isaiah chapter 52. Um, Isaiah chapter 52, specifically verses 11 and 12. Um, but I would encourage you to read the whole chapter. You'll get an idea of what this is talking about. By the way, the last half of verse uh, of chapter 52 deals with uh, the one that is pierced for our transgressions. Um, but Isaiah chapter 52, verse 11 says, Depart ye, depart ye, go ye out from thence, touch no unclean thing. Go ye out of the midst of her, be un be clean, that bear the vessel of the Lord, for ye shall not go out with haste, nor go by flight, for the Lord will go before you, and the God of Israel will be your reward. And we don't have time to make comment on that, but I want you to know that that is what he's referring to in verse 17. So if you get home, you have some time, I'd encourage you to read over chapter 52 of Isaiah. Okay. All right. Thank you for your patience today as we go through this. I, I almost stopped when we were 10 minutes out, but I kept going and... Uh, Sorry we had to cut it short. We'll, have to, we'll circle back probably and, and look at that again. But I would encourage you again to look at Isaiah chapter 52 uh, and then try to get an idea of what Paul is telling them uh, as he's wrapping up chapter 6, okay? All right. Um, tell you what, for time's sake, let's just go ahead and be dismissed in a word of prayer. We're thankful.